new cities. And if we stop being people like that, then we will hand down much less to our posterity than our ancestors handed down to us. So there's the choice in life. One either grows or one decays. Grow or die. I think we should grow. History proves that we have never lost by pressing the limits of our frontier. In the summer of 1989, the first President Bush announced the Space Exploration Initiative, directing NASA to draw up long-term plans to get humans back to the moon and begin developing a program of manned Mars exploration. NASA assembled a large team to take on the Space Initiative. In 90 days, the team developed a 30-year plan that required an enormous buildup of space infrastructure. What the NASA bureaucracy decided to do was basically uh, design the most complex mission they possibly could in order to make sure that everyone's pet technology would remain mission critical, which is the exact opposite of the correct way to do engineering. First, NASA would triple the size of the planned space station and add enormous hangars, as well as free-floating fuel depots, checkout docks, and crew stations. In space, they would build ships that could travel onto the moon. Then, on the moon, they would construct more shipbuilding facilities, bases, and depots. Next, the moon crew would construct the Mars ship, a huge craft dubbed by its detractors as Battlestar Galactica. This ship would carry everything to Mars over an 18-month flight. Once in Mars orbit, a small group would descend to the surface, spend a few days, then plant a flag in the ground and go home. The plan became known as the 90-day report. To those of us at Martin who had been engaged in designing Mars missions, when they saw the monstrosity of complexity of the 90-day report, we were dismayed, and it was readily apparent to anyone with any insight that that program would fail politically. The plan was submitted to Congress. The estimated cost, $450 billion. This would have been the single most expensive program for the United States since World War II. By the end of 1990, Congress had refused all requests for SEI funding. Zubrin favored launching a Mars mission directly from the surface of Earth, using only existing rocket technology. This negated the need for a lunar base and avoided the complexity and cost of building ships in space. He also objected to NASA's plan for a short surface stay on Mars, a mission that would amount to little more than a flag and footprints exercise. To Zubrin, we were going to Mars to explore and develop a new world. To maximize surface time, Zubrin proposed using a faster flight path, known as a conjunction class mission. This would mean a crew could arrive on Mars after only a six month journey. They would then remain on the Martian surface for a year and a half. This would give the team time to explore a wide area and conduct detailed research about the planet. Then, as the Earth return window opens, the crew would launch from Mars six-month trip home. Along with several like-minded colleagues, Zubrin decided to ask management at Martin to allow them to design alternative Mars missions. The management approved that, and we formed a team that was known as the Scenario Development Team of just 12 people from the whole very large Martin company. One team member, whose thinking was closely aligned with Zubrin's, was David Baker. I went off to my office and said, all right, how would I do a Mars mission if I had to pay for it and I had to go on the ride? And I said, well, it's going to be simple. There's going to be no on-orbit assembly. I really tried to take everything out of the mission that didn't absolutely need to be there. While the rest of the team focused on longer-term, more traditional mission plans that required on-orbit assembly, Zubrin and Baker decided to collaborate on a mission that could be done near-term. We decided to do Mars the way Lewis and Clark did America. Okay. Use local resources. Travel light, live off the land. Zubrin and Baker were convinced that a Mars mission could be launched directly from the ground. The other team members felt this was impossible, that the weight of the rocket fuel required for a round trip to Mars was so enormous it would render the launch ship impossibly heavy. 
solve this problem, Zubrin was exploring a radical idea that had been kicked around the aerospace industry since the mid-70s. The idea was to produce a methane-oxygen rocket fuel directly from the Martian atmosphere. It was a relatively simple and robust chemical engineering procedure that was done commonly in the 1800s, the era of the gaslight. If the idea worked, astronauts could land a relatively light ship with empty tanks. They wouldn't have to ship all the fuel with them for their return trip. This would radically lower their size and weight. The only problem was methane-oxygen fuel requires a hydrogen component. Hydrogen exists on Mars in the form of H2O, but water may be difficult or impossible to extract from the Martian environment. Really, the hydrogen was only 5% of the total weight of the methane-oxygen propellant being manufactured. So if you just say, okay, we won't be pure, we won't get all of the propellant from Mars, we'll just get 95% of the propellant from Mars. The other 5%, the hydrogen, will just bring from Earth. Another fundamental resource that could be extracted from the Martian environment is oxygen. A second processing unit could separate oxygen molecules from the thin carbon dioxide atmosphere, providing breathable air for a Mars crew. If used intelligently, the same resources that make Mars interesting are precisely what could make it attainable. Baker and Zubrin had greatly reduced their mission mass, but they still found their ship was too heavy and would require two launches and assembly in space. Then Zubrin hit on an idea. Well, one of the key events of the Mars Direct Development was one morning Bob burst in my office and said, I've got it. The idea that I finally hit on in 1989 was that we would split the mission up into two parts and we'd send the return vehicle out first with its own return propellant plant. So the propellant would be made on Mars before the first astronauts ever left Earth. With two separate direct-to-Mars launches, a human crew would have a fully fueled ship waiting for them on the surface of Mars before they ever left Earth. So Zubrin and Baker had come up with a plan that seemed to accomplish all of their goals. It was relatively inexpensive, development time was short, they could use existing technology, and it allowed for a long stay on the Martian surface. They dubbed their idea Mars Direct. SSC, disconnect, enable on. Very fine. Let guys go. Hydraulics go. Aboard an Ares rocket, Mars Direct begins with the launch of the Earth Return Vehicle, or ERV. No one is aboard this ship. It will pave the way for the astronauts who, years later, will use the ERV to return to Earth. Three, two, one. 